Hello and welcome to this live stream. I am Jonas, the creator of vhdelvis.com and I am sitting here in my uh, apartment in Bangkok. This is my home office in Bangkok, Thailand. And uh, today we're going to do some uh, VHDL coding right here live on Facebook. For the very first time I'm going to try out this thing. So uh, just to write if you have any questions or comments in the comment section, I'll try to keep an eye on them. And uh, I have with me some toys here, this uh, breadboard here. Let me just point my camera towards it. So this is a breadboard which we are using in the dot matrix course. Um, it has a, an, a, a FPGA development board mounted on it. This is a lattice eye stick with a lattice eyes 40 FPGA. And there's a dot matrix display and a 64 bit 8 by 8 LED display and all of these supporting electronics, these analog electronics are for driving the LEDs on this display from the FPGA pins. So I'm going to switch to my screen here. So this is what I'm looking at at the screen right now. This is VS Code Editor with an empty VHDL project. This is just a skeleton of the VHDL project. Uh, I have defined the input and output ports. So we have the input clock here and two output vectors, one rows output vector and one columns output vector. And these are both 8, bit wide, eight bits wide. And they can be used for controlling the, um, for activating the rows and the columns on this dot matrix display. So I have already assigned them here in, in the Lattice Ice Cube 2, the design software from Lattice. I have assigned them to pins on the FPGA. So I have already done this here, so that when we assign some values to them in our VHDL code, in our VHDL code here, we are actually controlling the pins on this dot matrix display. So how does the dot matrix display work, really? Let's go and have a look at what it looks like inside. So this is what a dot matrix looks like inside. There are rows and columns of LEDs and there are 64 of them in total, but we can only control one uh, column or, or one line at a time because one column pin is connected to the anode of the, of the whole row of LEDs and one row pin is connected to the cathode of all of the LEDs in one row. So we can illuminate and discriminate between all of the different LEDs in one column at a time or one row at a time. We cannot control, cannot control the whole display. Okay, so that's basically how these dot matrix displays work. And let's see if we can illuminate one LED in this display just by using our VHDL code right now. Okay, so we know that these two output vectors, they control the rows and the columns on this board. So the rows here and the columns, they are controlled by these two VHDL vectors. Let's start here in the architecture. I'm going to index in one of the rows, uh, one, one bit in the rows, and set it to the value one, like this. So now we're indexing bit number three in this output vector, this eight bit output vector, and setting it to one. And same with the columns output, so I'm going to set column bit number three to one, like this just save it. So we're just driving two output bits from the FPGA to one and all of the others will be unconnected. So let's go over to uh, Lattice Ice Cube. This is the FPGA design software from Lattice. And I'm going to go to Tools and select Run All and this will cause the uh, synthesis to start and everything. Oh, hi Ahmed, Ahmad. Sorry, I pronounced your name incorrectly. Nice to have you with me. So we have some viewers already. Good to hear from you. Just ask if you have any questions. I'll just try to answer them as good as possible. So now the, um, the, um, the place and route is running and this is a really small design. So the bitmap has already been generated. So the process is complete. I'm going to Diamond Programmer, which I have already set up. This is also the programmer from Lattice with the bit file here. So when I press program, our VHDL code is going to go onto FPGA. So here on the board, we're going to see probably some lights flashing here. 
programming is still going on. Takes a few seconds. There we go. We have uh, one LED illuminate just from this simple code. So this is when counting from this side here. It's uh, column number zero, one, two, three, because we indexed bit number three and we start counting from zero and also from the rows, row number zero, one, two, three. So that wasn't that difficult to illuminate one LED inside of here. But maybe we can do something more. I, I want to do something a bit more complicated. I want to go from one uh, row to the next every second. So to step from this row to that, to the next row to the next. Then when we reach this one, go back to the first row and illuminate this LED. I want this light to go from one row to the next every second. See if we can do that. So I'm just going to erase all of the code which I just wrote. And we're going to use the clock signal now, because we're going to have to uh, measure some time. We're going to measure one seconds of one second of time. So I'm going to use this clock signal. We're going to create a clock process for measuring time. And what is the clock frequency on on the on this board? Well, I know that the oscillator on the lattice I stick is 12 megahertz. Uh, it can run on higher clock frequencies, but that's the base frequency. So we're going to create a constant here name it clock frequency like this. It's going to be of type integer and it's going to have the value 12 mega, 12 E6, that means 12 million. Okay, so that's our clock frequency constant. Then I'm going to create a new process, SPRO. I'm using a snippet to create a process here just to save us some time. I'm going to label it counter, yeah, counter process, that seems like a good na name. And this is a clocked process, so that means that it reacts only to the clock signal. And it's going to, uh, every time the clock signal changes, this process wakes up and what's inside of here is run. And on every rising edge of the clock, which should happen 12 million times every second, because it's 12 me megahertz clock, then what's ever inside of here will be run. And what we're going to do here is to count the number of clock periods because this inside of here happens 12 times every, 12 million times every second. So I want to count the number of clock cycles so that we can uh, know when one second has passed. So we're going to go ahead and create a signal here. Clock counter, I'm going to name it. It's going to be of type integer. And I'm not going to constrain this with a range uh, here although you should do because this is just a quick demo, so we'll just go ahead and use it like this because we can. And also this process doesn't have any reset. There's no reset input here. We should use reset in FPGAs, but right now, just for this demo, we're not going to use the reset. We're just going to go ahead and use the initial values that the signals get inside of the FPGA. So I'm going to type out some code here. If clock and a, um, counter, equals clock frequency. Uh, I'm just going to talk about it in a minute. So if clock frequency and number of clock cycles has passed, then we're going to do something else. If not, we're going to do something else. And if. So if we have counted the clock frequency number of clock cycles, actually clock frequency minus one, because then if not, we'll be, we'll be counting one too many because Zero is also a value that we count. So um, then we're going to set the counter back to zero. So I'm just going to explain this in a second, just typing it out for now. If not, we're going to increment the counter by setting counter to counter, uh, actually clock counter like this, clock counter. Just use the wrong name here. Don't worry, I can replace it. We're going to increment the clock counter like this by one. So what's going on here is that on every rising edge of the clock, this is going to happen. And if the clock counter has the extreme value of clock frequency minus one, then we're going to reset clock counter back to zero. If not, which will happen most of the time, we're going to increment the clock counter, effectively counting the clock cycles. So we know that what happens here inside of here is going to this is going to occur once every second, this resetting of the clock counter. 
but I want to go from row to row on every second. So we want to, in, on this display, go from this row to the next every second. So we have to create a counter for counting or indexing the rows. I'm going to do that right below here, create a row counter, type in, integer. Actually, I think we're going to use an unsigned here actually, because there's some advantage about the unsigned for this. Because we have a, um, uh, eight rows, and then, then it fits to use an unsigned because it wraps uh, automatically. So I'm going to create this one two down to zero like this. This is a three bit unsigned and a three bit binary uh, uh, number can uh, uh, can have all the values between zero and seven. And that's exactly the, the, uh, the indexes of the, these rows because we have eight rows. So then it fits now to use an unsigned there. For the clock counter, we had to use the integer because 12 mega, I don't think that's a multiple of two, it isn't. But for this row counter, we can do that. So what are we going to do with this row counter? We're going to increment it every second. So when the clock frequency number of clock cycles has passed, then this one will wrap around. But in here, we know that one second has passed since the last time we were in here. So then we can go ahead and uh, oh, um, use this row counter. Row counter gets the value of row counter plus one, like this. So now we're incrementing the row counter every second. Yes, so now we have a row counter which should cycle from zero to seven every second. But what are we going to use it for? Because these are the output signals, the rows and the calls outputs. Well, let's create a new process now. Just below the, the other one, I'm going to use a snippet also here, just to save some time typing. This one I can name output proc. Output proc is the label of this process. And in the sensitivity list, we're not going to use the clock this time. It's not going to be a clocked process. We're going to use the row counter. What does this mean then? There's no rising edge here and the clock isn't here. This means that every time this process changes the clock counter, which happens every second, then this process is going to wake up because in the sensitivity list. So when this row counter signal changes, then whatever in, is inside of here is going to be run. And what do we want to do in here? Well, first I want to control these columns, but we're not going to do anything more with this, just the same thing we did before. So I want to illuminate one column. I'll just go ahead and write columns and select, for example, number three, as we had before. And just don't worry, we're going to change this later, but for this example, we're going to use only a row, like, no columns number three, column number three. So we're selecting one column and we're going to also select one row. And how do we do that? Well, we used a number three just for selecting a static uh, number the last time, but this time we're going to use the row counter for indexing the rows like this. And then we're going to set this bit to one, the bit that's indexed by the row counter. But you know this row counter, this is a an, uh, an unsigned. An unsigned cannot be used for indexing arrays directly, so we have to do some casting here. So this is VHDL, it's a strongly typed language. So you have to do casting if you don't have the correct type, but we'll just do that with a two integer function here. So now we should be able to index these rows and set the bit in the row signal which is indexed by the row counter to one. But we have to do something more also because every time we set the bit we're not resetting it to zero or something, we're just setting a new bit. So in the end all of the row bits would have the value one. So what, what, what we could do is just above here write rows and use an aggregate assignment, others gets the value zero. This aggregate assignment just means that all of the bits get zero here. And then on the next line, we set one of the bits to one. But this is all of inside of the same process. So it's not going to happen this one first and then that one. No, this is a process, so everything happens uh, instantly. 
what we're doing here is first setting this columns bit to one and then we're setting all of the bits to zero but we're not setting them we're just saying to the uh, synthesis tool we want all of these bits to be one in this time step and then the next line we're saying actually i want one of the bits to uh, we're saying first all of the bits should be zero and then on the next line we're saying i want one of the bits to be one so the, 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 val the signal values are not effective until the process terminates so the result is that all of the bits except one will be zero but the one selected by the rows counter will be one because the signal values are only be becoming effective at the end of the process so it's not first this one and that one everything happens instantaneously okay so let's save this file and see if i had any errors go to ice cube go to tools and select run all just to see if we can compile this and here we go no syntax errors at least place and route is running but still a small design so it shouldn't take a lot of time And the bitmap is complete, so we can go ahead and program the FPGA. And now, just watch what's going to happen here. It's going to see some flashing of lights here, and once the program is programming is complete, let's watch this one. And there you go. See here, every second we go to the next row, but we're still on, this, on just column number three. But it's working. So we have control of the time domain in our design by using the clock. We're counting the clock. But now I want to display something more here. I want to display a character here because this isn't very exciting really. I want to display something more. So let's go ahead and assign something else to this column. Not only illuminating column number three, but illuminating uh, all of the bits in, all, in every co column that should be illuminated to render some character. So I'm going to go ahead and define a new type because we have to have some way of of, um, of modeling this display, this 8x8 display. And what I'm going to do is to create a 2D array or a matrix, you can also say. And in VHDL you first have to create a type, you cannot just create a 2D array because you have to create the type of the array. So I'm naming it matrix type like this. It's just an arbitrary name is array and we have to define the range of the array 0 to 7 is going to be my range and what are the elements in this array going to be of yeah it's going to be this one because we're going to store the, the values for the rows so we want to store the values for the rows so we can write to this output from this matrix type so i'm copying this one standard logic vector 7 onto 0 like this then we need to create a signal of this one matrix actually i'm going to create a constant you know because we're going, not going to use we're not going to change this uh, this thing this object so i can create a constant constant matrix of type matrix type so now i created i defined a 2d array type of, of uh, length 8 and with eight, 64 elements in total. And I created a constant of this type. So this one can hold all of the information for which LEDs should be illuminated. And also I have to give a, an initial value or a value because this is a constant, we can do that here, but conveniently I already have some code laying here, which I've prepared for this uh, talk. So I'll just copy this one, and paste it in here. So what we see here is the constant definition of this 2D array, this matrix. And uh, these represent LEDs in the dot matrix display here. One value for each LED. And those that are zero are not illuminated, those that are one are illuminated. So if I mark the one values here, maybe you can see in the code here what it looks like. It's, it's, an, it's an F character 
Foxtrot F character. It can be a bit hard to see, but it's, it's inf rendering information for how to render an F character on this display. We're going to use this one to show the F character on the dot matrix display. So how do I do that then? Well, we have to go down in an output processor. Instead of only activating column number three, we're going to activate all of the columns by picking out the correct column from the matrix. And we're going to use the row counter. For that, actually, we have to use this to integer row counter for this. So now I'm taking the one row that we are displaying and assigning to the, all of the column bits the value that I pick from this matrix, one of the elements in this matrix. Okay, so let's save this and head over to IceCube and try to compile. Tools run all, so I'm just doing a compilation and synthesis and all of the design steps. We can see here how long it's going. It's going through the placement process now. So you can follow the, pro the progress here. It doesn't take a lot of time because it's a small project. There we go, the bitmap is complete, so I'll just go ahead and press program and we will see what happens now. Okay, some other patterns are emerging here. Let's get this on a bigger camera. Okay, so we can see. Uh, or you should be able to see that there are um, more LEDs here that are this, this being displayed. And this is because we are rendering this, uh, this F character now. So at the top, the F is wide, so we can see uh, many LEDs are illuminated. But if I didn't know it was S char F character, I couldn't see it. So this is going way too slow. So we, this is how dot matrix displays work. We have to cycle through all of these uh, rows and illuminate them fast enough so we can see the difference with our human eye and then it will look like a stable image. So let's try to go ahead and do that. We have to uh, cycle, scan through the rows a lot faster. I know we're doing it every second so it takes eight seconds for each uh, for each uh, um, for each image to be displayed on the screen and that's way too slow. So let's go ahead and create a new constant first. So below the clock frequency, I create a constant scan frequency. Okay, this is also going to be an integer. So now we're going to define how many hertz we're going to update this uh, display with every second. So let's, for example, pick 400, that 400 hertz. So we're going to render the character 400 times every second on the display and that should look good also on the camera, I think. Okay, so then we have this constant that we can use, but where should we use it? Let's copy the name of this down here, in the counter process here, where we are resetting the counter, uh, the clock counter signal. This is where the uh, timing of, of, of the road change occurs. So this is where it's controlled. So. Not right now we are counting clock frequency, which is one second for each row, and that's way too slow, so we're going to have to make this number a bit smaller by dividing it by the scan frequency. But this also is not enough, because then we're going to change from one to the next with 400 hertz, one row to the next, but there are eight rows, so we, if we want to update the whole display 400, 400 times every second, we have to also multiply this number by eight, by eight rows, okay? Let's save this file now, see if we can compile it here. Back in IceCube 2, oh, we got some syntax error here. 36, 56 is the line, Let's see if we, was it 36? 39, 56, so we forgot the parentheses, that's typical. Let me go do it again.
laser is running. This process can take hours or even days on a large FPGA design, but this really small chip just takes a few seconds or a minute. Finally, program the FPGA and see what we got. There you have it. The F character is rendering and it's just scanning through all the rows so fast that you can't see the difference. And this is this is how you know those billboards, this is how they work. They scan through all the rows quickly so it renders the image, just like an old TV. It looks quite good, you can see the F character, but there's some artifacts here. So we can see uh, the um, these LEDs are are completely black, but these are illuminated. But in between here, there are some LEDs that are partly illuminated. And this is because we are switching from one row to the next very quickly. So we're switching from this row and to the next row without pause. And it's almost instant instantaneously. And what happens if we look at the timing diagram here? If this is, this is the clock signal on every rising edge here, something is happening. And Suddenly, we change from one row to the next, and we switch off one row and switch on the other. And what um, what happens then with the analog uh, circuit here? It's, it cannot change fast enough because it can't, the, the, uh, these transistors and these circuits cannot switch off and on, ag on again as fast as this FPGA can switch rows. So we get some creepage uh, current through some of the LEDs, and that's what's causing this um, this partial illumination. Now you can fix this by creating a dead band period. So a period where both of the rows here are switched off, like a dead band period is the name. And I'm going to show you how to do this, but not in this live stream, because I show you how to do this in the course, in the dot matrix course where we use this, this display. And also, right now we just programmed like in the code editor here, and we went straight to Ice Cube 2 and we and we um, um, and we program the FPGA, and I would I would never do that really, because uh, it's not going to work for a re real life FPGA design. Uh, that's not possible. You have to create a test bench first. Okay, so switch to me here. You're going to have to create a, a test bench first, and uh, and in the dot matrix course, I'm showing you how you can do that for a a large FPGA design. So I'm showing you how we can do this for a larger FPGA design, and we're going to create test benches for self-checking test benches for every uh, level of the design. And we're also going to create more complicated design. It's not going to just show one character. It's going to have a, um, a, um, a, a connection to the computer over USB. And we're going to create a UART um, receiver in the FPGA and a UART transmitter also for transmitting the characters back to the to the uh, computer, so that when we type on the computer, we type, so type something in the serial terminal, it's going to be displayed on the dot matrix display. And we can, uh, we're going to use Blockram for storing the rendering information for all of the characters. You can find information about this course on... Uh, oh, hi Marcel! I have a friend, Marcel is watching. Didn't realize before now. Cool. Yeah, we're going to have the rendering information um, stored in Blockram and when we type something on the computer, the FPJ is going to decode that character and find the rendering information and put it on the screen. And it, it's, the, the dot matrix cor course really teaches you how to handle a large scale FPJ project. It's not that complicated, this project, and you can create the prototype, the physical prototype. Um, but the course, I only, um, I only launched it uh, a few times every year because I have to, I don't have time to um, market it all the time and follow up the students. Uh, so it's better if I launch it a few times every year so I can spend the rest of the year, year creating new courses and creating free content. That's why the, F the course is closing for enrollment on Monday and I won't open it again until the spring 2020. So if you want to join this course, which is a comprehensive VHDL test bench course, then you, uh, you can go to uh, the description of this video 
and click the link and uh, register there. Okay, that's what I had for you this, guy, this time around. I'm sure there will be other programming live streams. I think this went actually quite well. So I'm going to uh, think of some other live streams that I'm going to, to, uh, to do. Yeah, there's the course in the comments here. There's the course page. Um, I'm going to think of some other live streams that we can do in between the course launches and um, I'll notify you about them. Okay, it was nice having you around. It's a great, great uh, thing to do on a Saturday afternoon. Have a nice day and keep coding.